I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like there are far few people here this morning <laughs> than there were yesterday. Maybe it was everybody had too much fun last night. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Emily Stolfo. Um, I work for MongoDB. Um, if you've ever used Ruby with MongoDB, you've probably used a couple lines of my code. Through the gems, Mongoid, Mongo, Bison, Bison Extension, Origin, uh, different versions of Mongo. Mongo Kerberos, if you ever feel like doing authentication using Kerberos. Um, I think all of the downloads I have on that gem are me just testing it in my testing environment. Um, so I'm coming from Berlin, but I come from New York. I've been in Berlin now for three years, and um, I've been working there because I originally went there to work with the other person who um, built the Ruby driver. And before I start, I want to thank the organizers for having me. I've never been to Singapore before. Uh, I arrived a week ago, and I think um, I've uh, sweat my weight in water every single day. It's kind of like Bikram yoga. I feel really good at the end of the day, really cleansed. Um, and I brought omiyage for the organizers, but I also brought omiyage for you um, to thank you for coming here at 10 a.m. on the second day of the conference. Um, so I brought, so I can't bring something for everybody, but I brought um, these amazing artisanal mustards from Germany. And anybody who's German is disqualified from this competition, by the way. Um, so these are little mustards from a little man who has a mustard shop next to my apartment. And I've hidden three Sandy Metz quotes in my talk. And if you can email me with one of those three quotes at Emily at MongoDB, um, I'll give you a little mustard. So the first three people, basically it's to trick you into paying attention. And also so I can steal some of them for quotes without feeling guilty. Huh? <laughs> and they're all different types, so. Um, um, okay, so. This talk is called Refactoring Humpty Dumpty Back Together Again. So bef because it's 10 AM and there's no better time to talk about physics, I'm going to start with the second law of thermodynamics. Specifically, the second law of thermodynamics accounts for the direction of natural processes. We've all heard of this, right? OK, no. <laughs> well, good thing I'm telling you about it. Um, the law says that it's highly unlikely, though not impossible, to restore a system to a previous state. It accounts for the asymmetry between past and future. In modern times, this law is defined in terms of entropy. We've all heard of entropy, right? Yeah, more so than the second law of thermodynamics. It's kind of abstract, but it basically is the measure of the number of ways in which a system can be arranged. Measuring entropy is taken to be the measure of disorder of a system. The higher the entropy, the higher the disorder. And usually it's depicted like this, where it requires a certain amount of work to take something that's in a high level of disorder and make it orderly or restore order. So once upon a time, there was this egg named Humpty Dumpty. And his story was told in this nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's women couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Has anybody heard of this? I bet a lot of British people have heard of this. So this particular nursery rhyme is the most well-known nursery rhyme in the English language, and it references to it can be found in many works of literature and frequently in popular culture. I think there's the character in Shrek who's Humpty Dumpty in one of the Shrek, like, number 15 movies that they've had. Um, and, uh, but the first recorded version dates from the late 18th century England. Like many traditional stories or poems, it's pretty much impossible to pinpoint what the original version was, what Humpty Dumpty actually was, um, or to take the poem literally. For example, we have other versions of the poem. This is the actual first recorded version, published in 1797, but we have no idea if this existed way before 1797, or people just learned how to write in 1797. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Fourscore men and fourscore more couldn't make Humpty Dumpty what he was before. So Humpty Dumpty. There are clearly many other versions um, throughout popular culture, throughout history. But what we can't ignore is that Humpty Dumpty is always depicted as an egg, despite the fact that there's nothing indicating in the poem that he actually was an egg. My favorite is that woman dressed as an egg who's really chic, sitting on a wall up in the corner. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's likely the rhyme was originally a riddle that could have exploited a well-known meaning of the term Humpty Dumpty at the time. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary says that the term Humpty Dumpty refers to a drink of brandy boiled with air, ale. And I don't know about you, but when I drink my brandy boiled with air, ale, something magical happens and I start seeing eggs. Um, perhaps the, the rhyme was equivalent to the 17th century's don't drink and drive propaganda warning you about sitting on walls after you drink. Um, but still, why an egg? Perhaps it was meant to convey that whatever it was that sat on that wall, it was extremely fragile and virtually impossible to put back together. So as I said, there have been many other theories, many other versions, and one of the ones that I find kind of funny or absurd is that um, was put forth by this scholar, I don't know what he was a scholar of, um, but I guess he spent his time trying to figure out what Humpty Dumpty was um, in the 50s, and he said that Humpty Dumpty was in fact a tortoise siege engine, which is this kind of machine battering ram that was invented by the Romans and used unsuccessfully in the English Civil War in the 1600s. And apparently it was used and the thing broke without breaking the thing it was trying to break. And so they wrote a poem about it. Um, I don't know about you, but that sounds really silly to me. Um, I think I like the idea of an egg better. Um, this theory was eventually determined to be totally ridiculous, but it, that idea was incorporated into a children's opera called All the King's Men, so it's just as true according to popular culture as the other theories. So whichever form Humpty Dumpty takes, what can't be ignored is that he's a fragile guy. He's actually become a sort of symbol for the second law of thermodynamics. Humpty Dumpty fell from the wall and subsequently ended up in pieces. As we've discussed, the law says that it's highly unlikely, though not impossible, to restore him to his exact state before the fall. And this is what the poem also emphasizes. As we also discussed, the second law of thermodynamics, modern definition is in terms of entropy, the measure of the number of ways in which an isolated system can be arranged. Specifically, assuming for simplicity that each of the microscopic configurations is equally probable, entropy of the system is the natural algorithm of the number of configurations multiplied by the Boltzmann constant Kb. This is theoretically how we can measure entropy, but nothing ever is, like you can't have a system where all the arrangements are equally probable, so this is highly theoretical. We can also find some examples of things that were broken and that have been returned to their original states with help. The Beauvais Cathedral, which is located in Beauvais, France, 60 kilometers north of Paris, is a symbol of the ambition of Gothic architects. The pet project of a wealthy and disaffected bishop of Nanteuil, the construction of the cathedral may have been partly intended as an act of defiance against the French crown. So basically the bishop was a punk and he wanted to prove that he was better and more powerful than the crown by building this massive building, and you'll see that it was a total disaster. The whole project was extremely unrealistic and the cathedral was never finished. Construction was started in 1225, and it was meant to be the greatest church in the kingdom, but centuries of construction were marked by structural problems and collapses. If the nave, which is the main body of the church, so church well, cathedrals are normally shaped like a cross, so the nave is the main body, and all that was actually constructed is the tiny portion at the top, like the head of the cross. Um, so if the nave had been constructed, the plans for the cathedral were such that it would have been the tallest building of its time. The foundations in order to support this massive structure were in some places 10 meters deep. Even so, in 1284, part of the choir collapsed, which is like the front of the cathedral that was actually constructed. Then the transept, I actually don't know what part of the cathedral that is, I forgot to look it up. Um, this other part of the cathedral was started 150 years later and was completed in 1548. Then shortly afterwards, the spire and half of the bell tower collapsed on Ascension Day during a service and apparently nobody was hurt. In 1600, construction of the nave, so that main body of the cathedral, began again, but only the first arch was erected and they gave up. In the 1990s, because this became such a symbol and such a look into um, like the buildings that, that exist today from this time that were great engineering feats, by definition, were great engineering feats because they're still around today. But this one's a look into how these projects can be started and fail because of ineptitudes or overambitious people. Um, so in the 1990s, like we really want to preserve this building, and in the 1990s it was determined to be so um, immensely unstable because the pillars had been measured to have moved 30 centimeters, and um, they wanted to do something about it so this building could still stand. 
So why is it so unstable? Why is it so weak? And why was this project so difficult to be realized? The building is the perfect storm of par poor architectural plans, different architects hacking on the same building, no real ownership of the projects, architects coming and going over the centuries, which, by the way, means they have much different styles, and the fierce gall-force wind, wind, winds that come from the English Channel that are less than 100 miles away. So basically, the cathedral might as well have been made out of paper mache. It's on the World Monuments Fund list of 100 most endangered sites. Um, but today, the cathedral is more stable than it has ever been, thanks to a team of researchers from Columbia University. So what did they do? They did what you would expect someone to do who needs to repair a weak structure. They studied the structure. So in 2001, a team of Columbia University, from Columbia University went to Beauvais to acquire 3D range scans and imagery of the cathedral. The goal was to create a 3D model of the cathedral to assist historic preservation efforts, including um, structural analysis of the cathedral. So for 10 days, they roamed around the cathedral using instruments to record digital images of its facade and interior by bouncing laser beams off its surface. They returned to New York City with 75 of these scans, each one containing more than a million data points. And remember, this is 2001, so 16 years ago. And at the time, um, like we could probably do that with our iPhones now, but at the time, this was the largest structure to ever be scanned with, um, that yielded the most amount of data. And this is a combination of all those scans from the data that they collected. So here's the flyover of the cathedral. This is what the image that they were able to collect looked like. And as you can see, it's, it's only a small portion of what the original cathedral was meant to be. Um, but the structure is really large and complex and has a lot of um, cavity. It's not just like a block, you know, like there's a lot going on in this cathedral. And then this is the inside. So I, I did my undergraduate education in art history and computer science and actually took this professor's class. And he showed us this. And I, I was like super excited because I was like, this is why I'm doing both of these fields, because you can do things like this and, and preserve cultural heritage. And so um, the, just as an aside, the, um, the reason this cathedral was meant to be so large, or like what motivated that, was Gothic architecture. Part of its principle was to, especially with cathedrals, was to elongate the structure so you felt closer to God and you had this sense of being in this infinite space. And so that's why the bishop was uh, particularly hubris in doing this, because he was trying to bring himself too close to God. So he was flying too close to the sun. Because of the model that the team of researchers was able to create, the support beams have been able to be installed in the right places, restoring stability to the cathedral and allowing visitors to appreciate the ambition and engineering of the Gothic builders 700 years ago, and also for academics to study how this project was started and failed. So what do the Beauvais Cathedral and Humpty Dumpty have in common? Both were in need of being put back together for st stability to be reestablished. So this system, in particular, has been restored to better order and stability, because as we said, it's improbable, not impossible. Furthermore, what if we aren't interested in restoring the system to its original state? What if we want to alter it, arranging the pieces to make it even better? What if breaking something allows you to rearrange the pieces so that it can be even more structurally sound? Does this sound familiar to you? Well, it certainly sounds familiar to me, because otherwise I wouldn't be doing this talk. And <laughs> um, it's something I've had to think a lot about lately, um, particularly with um, Mongoid. So recently, I had to study the structure of this project, break it a little, and then rearrange the pieces so that it was inherently stronger. I'd even argue that I defied the second law of thermodynamics, and the entropy has been decreased in this system. Um, who would uh, disagree that their project's entropy increases over time. So who thinks their project's entropy decreases over time with no work? Right. <laughs> um, so I maintain active records replacement for um, using MongoDB with Rails. Um, it's called Mongoid. It's actually 10 years old, which is basically 700 years in cathedral years. The first version of Mongoid, version 0.2.5, was released by who, someone who's now my colleague, Jaren Jordan. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, he's, he's the original author, and by the way, on the original documentation site of Mongoid, he says, Mongoid was conceived one late night in February, uh, 
in somewhere in Florida um, after five glasses of whiskey. And that's like pretty much the theme of like how Mongoin was built. Just like someone on whiskey. Um, version, I mean, I love Dern, he's amazing, but um, we're talking about Dern 10 years ago. Version 0.2.5 was released by Dern on October 1st, 2009. Version 0.2.6 was released on October 1st, 2009. Version 0.2.7 was released on October 1st, 2009. <laughs> Does it sound like any cathedrals you know? Um, the MongoDB server version at that time was less than 1.2.0. I actually don't know what version it was because in our project, matching, um, project tracking tool, um, the earliest version recorded is post Mongoid's first release. Um, and so for reference, MongoDB's server version, the current version is 3.4. So I think at 1.2.0, it was still in this phase where we had this feature that it dropped your data. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, Mongo continued to be developed by Durham. And also, by the way, MongoDB doesn't drop your data. I don't know if you've like, read anything in the last five years, but <laughs> we've solved that problem. Um, anyway, Mongo continued to be developed by Durin, who was working at SoundCloud in Berlin, in his free time. It was a true open source project for many years in that many people contributed. Many pull requests were open and merged. Many discussions were had in the GitHub's issues list. Many people solved approximate problems, but nobody had the big picture. It was built when the MongoDB server was quite simple compared to what it is now. There weren't many features or even replica sets at the time. So uh, the history of this, this project and the complexity of the ecosystem built around Mongoid and how it fit into Rails and how it used the driver is really complex and it might sound familiar to you if you're working on open source. Um, the first version of Mongoid, so like, uh, following along with this diagram, anything gray is not developed by MongoDB Inc., the company that I work for. Um, anything in color is. So the, f the first versions of Mongoid use the MongoDB Inc.'s Ruby driver, the 1X series. This is the driver that I was hired to work on five years ago. At the time I joined the company, Dern had just built his own driver called Moped because the official MongoDB driver hadn't developed some features he was hoping to have. And there was some back and forth and some friction. So he was, because the server was kind of simple at that time, he was like, okay, I'm just gonna build my own driver so I don't need to like, have this extra level of, um, of uh, diplomacy <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to get changes um, to move forward with Mongoid. Um, so at that time, Mon the, the Ruby offering, if you're using MongoDB with Rails, was, um, entirely, was developed entirely outside of MongoDB Inc. And uh, wasn't developed by anybody who was actually paid money to do it. So at MongoDB at this time, we knew how important MongoDB was to the Ruby community. Basically, if anybody wanted to use MongoDB with Rails, went through MongoDB. And basically, anybody wanting to program in Ruby was, unfortunately, as someone said yesterday, using Rails. So by the transitive property, anybody wanting to use Mong MongoDB, what, Ruby with MongoDB would have to go through any code that wasn't actually developed by the company, if that makes sense. Um, the company was growing, as were the features of MongoDB and the sophistication <laughs> opacity of the behavior. So it was really difficult for someone in the open source community to keep up with what the server was doing because they didn't have that insight than, that um, I have working for the company where um, the like, insider knowledge where you know what the roadmap is, you know what the internal issues are, what the priorities are. You can walk over to a server engineer's desk and ask them about something specifically because MongoDB has a lot of quirks, a lot of, um, between server versions, the implementation of certain features can differ wildly. So sure enough, at that time, MongoDB's issue list grew and the project started to lose traction and trust in the community because it just couldn't react fast enough. In 2014, the 1X driver needed a rewrite. And so we saw it as a great opportunity to approach Dern and say, hey, do you want to come work at MongoDB? We can build a new driver and then we get MongoDB to use that new driver. And then we're taking off that burden from your side because we can maintain the driver. Um, so he was up for it in 2014, he joined us and he and I worked together to build a new driver, um, which is kind of my way to get to Berlin. Um, and it was the MongoGem version 2.0. And then um, in doing that, we were able to, uh, we decided that we would bring Mongoid in, in house as well. So then Mongoid became an official project. Um, since then, Dern has moved on to work on another team at MongoDB, Compass, if you're familiar with their products, they're, it's the GUI for navigating your data and collections. Um, and I've taken over Mongoid and the driver. And just to, as a little aside, just to like, show you how this is actually a simplified version of the story, there's also a gem called Origin, which is the uh, DSL 
query language for um, querying MongoDB. That was a separate gem, but in version 6.0, I brought it into the code base because I realized not a lot, lot of people were using it independently. Um, so that's super complicated also. Um, so like, for example, if I need to fix a bug in um, Mongoid 6, I can do it in Mongoid's code base, but then if I want to backport it, I have to go and release a separate version of Origin. So now that Mongoid and the driver are back together again, they're getting along quite well, except for the occasional bickering over who does the dishes. Um, the work is done, um, the relationship's going well, um, but a lot of baggage has been brought back into the relationship by Mongoid. So at first I was excited about all of this, everything seemed so clean and centralized, and I was excited to start working on Mongoid and the driver, and that Durham would be moving on to another team so I'd have more responsibility. Um, but I quickly realized that I inherited a ton of work. Namely, there were 199 problems, and they were all Mongoid issues. We imported the GitHub issues list from Mongoid, for Mongoid into Jira, and it was a, it was a disaster. Um, I almost had a heart attack. There were a ton of issues, and I didn't think I would ever get through them. I think there actually were 199. Um, a lot was broken, the project was in pieces, the community was fragmented. How could I bring the project back into good standing with its users, restore trust and communication? How could I restore its structure and reduce entropy, hopefully restoring entropy to its original state? Was it possible to make Mongoid even better than it was before? So I did what the King's men and women tried to do for Humpty Dumpty. I did what France, the world's monument fund, the Columbia Computer Science team tried to do. I studied the structure, identified the pieces, the weaknesses, and I tried, and I kind of succeeded, to put Mongoid back together again. So how did I do this? I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about how you can take an existing project, because I'm sure you all have them, who are in dire need of a refresh and put them back together. There are many presentations and books on how to refactor. The problem is solved, and there's no need to reinvent the wheel or retell you a lot of the things that you can just look up or watch other presentations on. Every type, type of code smell is identified, and recipes are given for refactoring. The definitions can be overwhelming, but who can really apply them perfectly? Like, I read the definitions too, and I would like identify some of those things in my code base, but they couldn't, it's kind of like this equation on the second law of thermodynamics. It's a guide for how to understand the concept, but it can't actually be applied in practice. So I'm going to tell you a much more human story of how I refactor Mongoid and put it back together again, because it's a very real project with very real problems. I'm going to share with you some tricks and things that I did um, that I applied to my process. We'll look at how I study the structure, then we'll talk about refactoring, and there's definitely a way to refactor and many better ways to refactor. Finally, we'll talk about how to avoid letting a project slip in, into this state in the future. So regardless of whether you're an open source project maintainer, I think you'll find that a lot of what I'm about to say can be applied to your own projects. We're all maintainers of some legacy code base, some pre-existing project. I bet you agree that the entropy and disorder of your, your code base increases over time. But I do think that we can pause, repair, and restructure our code bases to actually be stronger than they were before we started. Again, the second law of thermodynamics says it's improbable, but not impossible, to restore a system to its original state. We're engineers, and when we put our minds on something, we can make it happen. So Mongoid structural analysis. I spent a while addressing bugs in Mongoid, one by one, going through those 199 problems, because I didn't have a good sense of how everything worked. And at the time that Duran built Mongoid, metaprogramming was really popular, so he did things like, uh, I don't want to <laughs> bash his code. Sorry. <laughs> We can talk about that later. I mean, as I said, during, it's 10 years ago, so um, I'm glad he doesn't really watch conference talks that much. Um, but, but I knew in the back of my mind, I had to build up a familiarity with the structure of the code base, so I took notes in the code in a notebook, like literally with a pencil, on how everything worked together. I drew diagrams like an architect. I stepped through the code with Pry and wrote down the call stack. As I said before, many solutions were applied that approximately solved problems, but because not many people had the full picture. So like a typical case, obvious case is a pull request, fixing something very specific. It's really important to have a mental model of how a code base works in order to make high quality changes. Luckily, Dern also had my back in this case. Um, as I said, he was still at the company, so um, me trying to figure out why something was changed, uh, was, it wasn't good enough to look at get blame. I could 
look at get blame and say like, hey Darren, why did you do this? And he would give me this like whole story. And luckily he had a good memory and a lot of stories. And um, so that was, I, I re recognized that that was um, something that not everybody has, like that resource. Um, but that was also really good for helping me understand the history of this project. Um, so the like one thing that, that made this refactoring seem possible to me was uh, grouping your issues into category, gr grouping my issues into categories. Um, if you categorize the issues, you can see where the hot spots are and focus on them when rebuilding or repairing the structure. So a 3D model of Beauvais Cathedral was necessary for the same exact reason. In particular with Mongoid, I realized most of our issues had to do with behavior related objects. So I created an, ob uh, an epic in Jira to track all those issues related to relations bugs. And so when I say relations object, it's um, when you define a model and you say like a uh, book has one author, there's a macro that runs and it creates this object called relation and it saves it as into this global variable on the book class. And um, that object itself is uh, what caused a lot of problems and I tried to cluster and categorize my issues around that one thing so that when I focused on refactoring it, I knew what its needs were. Um, stepping through major code paths and taking notes is really important also. Um, choose code paths that you don't understand and step through them with pride. I know they're scary and it's really, really tedious, but it's really helpful to do that. Um, and as I said, there was a lot of metaprogramming, so that made it really opaque, really difficult. But I took notes in the code with, with comments as well. If something was, for example, an attribute accessor in one file, uh, Mongoid's um, its structure is made up of behaviors in different modules. So there are like a lot of different files that define a lot of different things about this one document class. And so I would I peppered the code base with a lot of notes. Um, so if so if I was following code path and I, was, and I saw a variable, I would say like, this is defined in X module. And that really helped me to understand the shape of the code base. And then lastly, draw diagrams for yourself, like literally with a pencil, like an architect. It was really helpful to do this as well. And seeing the structure visually helps you, um, I mean, again, like coming back to art history, it's kind of like a sculpture. You really, like there is a shape to your code base and you wanna understand it. So after I did all of that, um, what did I identify was a weakness? So I'm gonna give you a concrete example, like making that relations issue um, that I built that epic around um, like more concrete. Um, so you can follow along with it and see how I focused on one element of the code base that was the weakest and I spent, on, on which I spent the most time refactoring. After I refactored this one thing, I was able to close about 40 issues, which at the time that I was doing this was 50% of our issues. So I was really happy about that. I identified that we had one object that contained all the information about the relationship between two models um, in Mongoid. It was called metadata, and it was inherited from a hash. So it essentially was a hash, and it's basically like the laziest class you could ever have because it's just keys and values with no specific logic or behavior. So like a nightmare. <laughs> It was an object um, created when the model was loaded. So like when you write that actual rela relation in the model class, it would create this metadata class, which was just a hash. Um, so like writing book has one author would use a macro to create this metadata object, stick it onto the book class, and that's what it used throughout all of the code to determine what behavior an instance of a book should have, or even the class itself if you're um, querying or whatever. Um, so in code small terms, this is a classic bloated smell. This class knew and did way too much. I'm sure there are tons of other code small terms you can apply to this as well. So um, this is a metadata class definition. Does anybody notice something alarming about this comment? The grand pooba of information about any relation in this class. It contains everything you could ever possibly want to know. And by the way, possibly was spelled wrong. <laughs> um, which goes back to what I was saying about this being a whiskey project. Um, poor Darren. <laughs> um, as you can see, um, it was like basically like an eight ball. Like you just ask it anything and it can give you the answer. And it's totally random. Um, writing simple code is important, but let's define simplicity. Does simplicity mean that we should have the least number of classes? We should, does it mean that we should favor one basic object over multiple smaller different objects? Is having one metadata object saving all information about every type of relation the simplest and thus best design? Design decisions, I understand, do involve trade-offs. We so frequently chant DROI, don't repeat yourself, but sometimes we need to introduce a little bit of duplication in order to have a simpler design. Prefer duplication over the wrong abstraction. I'll give some examples of how the metadata object was used. So you'll see how it became obvious 
what rearranging had to be done, um, even without understanding anything about mongoid, I think you'll, you'll recognize what patterns should, um, that kind of come out of this code, and um, what needed to be done to restore structural stability to mongoid's code base. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say briefly that mongoid has two main types of relations because um, MongoDB is a document database. It has reference relations, which is what you would recognize from active record, so it's um, straight up like reference relations that are IDs, foreign keys saved on objects. Um, hasn't belongs to many is has many through, but there's no join table because MongoDB has a field that can be an array, so it's just saving arrays of the related objects on either end, and it's kept in sync. Um, and then embedded, which is uh, pretty self-explanatory. You can have embedded documents in MongoDB, so you have these types, which implement that um, relationship between embedded and parent documents. So this is one example instance method. It's called determine foreign key. And actually, when I was reviewing my slides uh, this morning, I, I didn't even see the first line. It says, determine the value for the relations foreign key, performance improvement. What? <laughs> I don't, that's something I would have to ask them about. Um, at first, <laughs> for the life of me, I could not understand what was going on. Basically, it's a no-op if the relation is embedded, but re embedded relations don't save foreign keys because they're embedded, they don't need them. So like, why would it return a foreign key in its options? Why would it even allow an option of a foreign key if it was a re uh, an embedded relation? Um, yeah, so there, this doesn't count as the Sandy Metz quote, by the way, but Sandy Metz says this thing where like, if you squint at the code, you can kind of see the structure and the shape will come out at you. And so I kept squinting my eyes at this, thinking like maybe something would come out of it, but I didn't really see much else <laughs> besides what was there. But I did notice that basically there are a couple of things. Like when you're doing a lot of refactoring, you get pretty good at recognizing these hidden patterns. And um, so when I came to this, uh, one thing I noticed was um, in my refactoring mindset is that um, like, first of all, if a foreign key option is set, it's returned. Nothing else is done. Um, if the object is embedded, it returns nil. And it should probably be before it checks if there's an option of a foreign key set. And the last thing is the relation object knows something the metadata object doesn't, though it uses the metadata's data or the meta metadata's metadata. <laughs> um, uh, but, and also the other thing which I want to add to this list is that this metadata object is supposed to be the relation, but there's also a relation object saved on the metadata class. So why aren't those conflated? Like, there, so there were actually these relation objects that had different behavior, but I, I didn't see why we needed to have this metadata class if we could just have these objects that have their own behavior. So here's another method just to give you a sense of how sticky this code base was. Um, it's used to get the names of an inverse relation given a certain relation. Um, the first method checks if the type is uh, polymorphic. Uh, I know it's kind of small, but it says it's self-polymorphic, look up inverses, and then otherwise it determines inverse, inverses. And <clears throat> when I looked at those two methods, they had a lot of overlap in logic. So I, it was really difficult to determine what um, logic should be extracted if some of the checks were repeated um, after they've been branched. <clears throat> Um, but basically, the point of showing you this is to show you that it's pretty clear that the metadata object was begging to be refactored into smaller object-oriented objects. The entropy or disorder of the system was way too high. Any bugs having to do with this code were virtually impossible to fix, and the structure was weak. <clears throat> the most obvious need was for there to be a reference and embedded namespace with objects that knew that they were referenced or embedded and had their own behavior. So I embarked on a journey to refactor the metadata object into different objects under the namespace reference and embedded. How did I do this? Did I do it all at once? Did I uh, read a lot of books and uh, learn about how to do this perfectly and then apply those practices? So I had a couple of false starts. I bought Martin Fowler's refactoring book, but I honestly didn't really get through much of it. Um, kind of wanted to learn I was, I was doing it. Um, I talked to my manager a lot, had some nervous breakdowns, um, but I learned that there are a lot of wrong ways to refactor and uh, a couple of right ways or better ways. <clears throat> so it's really important to do proper refactoring, not random refactoring. I like to think of in terms of the health of a project. This is something very similar to the way, there's something very similar to, between the way I refactor and work on my code bases and how I design my weekly exercise routine. I always ask myself when making changes to a code base, is this a healthy change? Is this a quick fix, like a piece of candy or a bag of chips that has a short-term payoff, like it's really yummy right now, but I know in the long term this probably isn't good for me. Um, 
We all have to refactor at some point. It's really important to have a plan and design for what you're going to do. Refactoring should require the same effort and process that you apply to building something from scratch. I think sometimes we forget that. Just plowing through and trying to fix everything you can along the way is definitely one of the wrong ways to refactor. So at this stage in the repair of Mongoid, I had done the structural analysis and identified the weaknesses. The next step was to refactor with a plan. Over the course of my refactoring of Mongoid, I learned a lot, and I'm going to share some of the highlighted steps with you. Again, I'm not going to go through like recipes or theories because you can read about that, and it's something we've talked about a lot, and because it's something we do a lot. Um, but I'm going to show you a couple of things that I did using this metadata object as an example, because I think it's like the classic case of um, something begging to be refactored. As, you, as I said, um, we can uh, yeah, read about this. Um, but I also watched a lot of talks along the way for guidance. I'm not saying that you should just dispose of all of the theory. I think it's really good to know it. But um, I'm going to like, share something that's kind of not really something, things that I read or heard about. Um, so the things that I learned were one to um, refactor one piece at a time, use tests at every step, and don't fix bugs. This one was really important. Um, so Martin Fowler, we know this, we can probably recite it in our sleep, defines refactoring as the process of changing a software system in such a way that it does not alter the external behavior of the code, yet improves the internal structure. So if we rearrange the system so the external behavior doesn't change, it doesn't matter if we re rearrange one corner of the system and then another corner of the system and do it piece by piece, because um, the outside behavior is not going to change. So what I did was first define a namespace called reference and create a class called belongs to, <clears throat> um, which seemed like a really obvious way to refactor this. I returned this object when a model um, was defined with a belongs to relationship and made sure all the tests passed before moving on to create another object. The largest benefit of rearranging the system piece by piece is you can test out different designs and not waste too much time overhauling everything only to realize your new design doesn't work. <clears throat> Agile principles aren't only for building new things. So as I said, you should apply the same practices to refactoring as you do to building something from scratch. I iterated over my refactor design. I tried out different hierarchies. I tried creating classes for things like a builder. So a builder is something like if you have a book and you build author, um, there's this builder thing that did that for you. If you bind something, it would, it would be book author equals another author. And so those things were objects originally. And um, I tried out having them be objects, um, but I thought it would be much better if they were modules because they're behavior and things that do something once. Like there's no reason to save instance variables on that builder because it's created um, as, a, as a side effect or um, byproduct of um, building an object or binding it to another one. Secondly, before you begin to refactor, make sure you have a solid suite of tests. Tests are the wall at your back. Refactor your tests simultaneously with your code. I can't emphasize this enough. You won't be able to figure out what went wrong with your design if you do all of your refactoring, then run the tests, and realize they're not passing. So this is uh, just an example of um, that thing lookup inverses that I, was, that I showed before. Um, I decided that I wanted, to, I wanted each object to know what their complements were. And so this is just an example. like. You, can, you have to port your existing tests, but you also have to write new tests. And this was a new test I had to write because um, uh, when I refactored each relation object, had to be able to ask another relation if it was a complement of itself. So that's a test that I wrote for that. So it's really important to add those tests in as well. And the last thing is don't fix bugs. Um, so along the way, I would, I, I had, <laughs> I was really familiar with this list of bugs um, in JIRA, and I, when I was refactoring the code, I would sometimes find the places or the sources of these bugs, and I, would, I was really excited to find these places, and I really wanted to fix them, but I had to be really self-disciplined about not fixing them and saving them for later. So this is just one example. When you have a list of embedded documents in a parent document, Mongoid would allow you to append that same document with the same ID onto that list, um, and it's, it's a pretty simple bug, nothing really that exciting. But when I was working on this code, this is the, um, the binder object, and it would allow you to append that, that embedded document twice to a list. And I, when I was refactoring saw this line, I was like, oh, that's where this is happening. But I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it later. But I would note it down um, in the JIRA ticket, like where to go to fix it. Um, 
And also, this idea became crystallized for me by my manager, who's, uh, he maintains a Java driver, and so he has a different way of thinking than I do. He's, uh, he has this like really booming, kind of godlike voice uh, that makes anything he say sound extremely significant. Um, with, and, but it is significant. <laughs> and in this case, uh, we have these one-on-ones every other week, and um, one time, he knew how much work I was putting into refactoring this project, and he also knew how many bugs I had to get through in, in, the, in the bug list. And so this one time, he was like, so, Emily, you're fixing, you're doing all this refactoring. I recognize that's a lot of work. Are you fixing bugs as well? And I was like, and I got really defensive. I was like, no, I'm not fixing bugs. Like, I don't have time for it. I really want to finish the refactoring before I do that. And he was like, good. You should never fix bugs while you're refactoring. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> pass that test. Um, <laughs> So he likes to ask these like trick questions that make me think really deeply, and like he's amazing, and he's great. Um, so the crucial point was um, perhaps the one that took the most self-discipline, as I said. Um, I I I really had to like tie my hands behind my back when I was doing a lot of this. Um, so the last thing that was part of this restoration is not. To, is to not always discuss in, it's not always discussed in books or refactoring presentations, nor is it specific to an open source project. It's that of responsible maintenance and restoring user trust. So this is kind of the same idea of like sustainable farming or responsible farming where um, farmers don't use chemicals or things that harm the environment for short-term benefit and financial payoff like, like red or tomatoes um, that uh, are at the expense of the soil and the long term, the longevity of their land. Um, so it's kind of the same idea with your project. You want to make sure that everything you do is with the long term and the health in mind. So it's just like starting a new exercise or eating regime. Improving Mongoy didn't mean applying this quick fix, like running for a couple of days and then like calling that my exercise regime and stopping for a while. I had to establish healthy habits going forward for the code base. This meant properly categorizing issues as they were open in the JIRA project. It meant responding to users right away in order to gather the most relevant information, even if I couldn't fix the issue right away, um, so that I could reproduce it. Because that's part of the problem with a lot of these issues that were imported into JIRA from GitHub. There's, a lot of those people like, didn't even code anymore. It's like going back to 2014, 2013. So I knew these problems existed, but I like, didn't really know how they got themselves into said hole. Um, and um, so release notes, documentation, basically any interface in the community had to be kept up to date so that people knew that Mongoid was alive. Um, so for example, I made sure our API document the docs were linked for our main documentation because a lot of people um, also were getting confused with Mongoid's old documentation, which was still around. Uh, so I had to make sure the documentation was really centralized and obvious. I release new versions regularly. Um, I make sure that I'm always in step with Rails and I respond um, to Rails's movement um, in our uh, march forward. <laughs> um, I follow semantic versioning closely. I make sure to tweet and I um, send out announcements on Google Groups so that people know the project is always moving forward and that they can trust that Mongoid is active, that there's someone working on it and um, that it's alive, as I said. And uh, the benefit of having worked on something, working on something that was quiet and passive for so long is that um, people don't realize I'm paid to work on Mongoi. And so when I respond to them right away, they're like so happy to get a response and like, like thanks so much for your work. And I'm like, I'm paid to do this. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's great. Like I think people, I can tell people are really happy that finally like the project is treated like, um, it's uh, that it's, it's being responsibly maintained. So after all this work, had I succeeded in reducing the entropy of the project? How, how did it compare to the entropy of the project before these changes? Entropy is pr a pretty abstract concept, as we've seen, and measuring it in the context of code bases seems even more intangible. As we heard in the beginning of the presentation, entropy is measured in terms of the number of ways in which a system can be arranged. We can't quite measure this in a code base, but I did, however, need to prove somehow to myself, my community, my manager, um, that my time spent was time well spent. So I measure entropy in these three ways, um, and also other ways, but I, I think about this constantly um, to help myself to, like, uh, make sure that Mongoid is always um, kept at a stable state. So how difficult is it to make changes? 
When you have a bug, sure it's difficult to find the source of the bug, but how difficult is it to actually fix that bug? Do you have to fix it in five different files? Do you fix it in one place and then run the test and cross your fingers and if it passes and you move on? Um, do you understand the structure of the code base enough to be confident that one fix uh, is the only place you need to make that fix? <clears throat> and then the other thing is, can you explain the design? So this was something I had to do, again, involving my manager. Um, he, we uh, were looking to have someone from, internally from MongoDB join the Ruby team, and uh, someone who's uh, a little bit newer um, to coding and to the company. And um, so he said to me, he was like, in preparation for talking to this person, he said, like, why don't you write down everything you need to know, um, everything you know working on this project and, something, and everything someone should know joining this project. And, so I was like, uh, that's a lot. But um, so <laughs> I met with the, the, the guy who was going to join the team, and I spent about an hour just explaining the complexity of the gem dependencies <clears throat> and what projects I was maintaining and what um, had, um, where the tentacles were um, between the gems. And, um, and I, so I did that, and I was like, I don't know if I can write down everything I know about working on Ruby, but but um, explaining the Mongoid code base, I can definitely do that now, and I couldn't do it before, because I, I both didn't really have that mental model, and I also didn't think there was much structure. And then the last thing is how is performance. Slow performance is another indicator of high entropy in your system. The messier and more inefficient code paths, the worse performance will be. Previous to doing this refactor, our Mongoid test suite would take between three and four minutes. After this refactor, it's taking eight. Um, so I was, I was freaked out for a little bit, and I was like, wow, that was a lot of work for nothing. Um, but it's because I introduced a thousand new tests, and they all dealt with um, creating classes and creating relationships, which is actually quite code heavy and um, involves creating classes. So it was understandable, the test suite got slower, but it made me realize that I needed to do some benchmarking, and luckily we had a pretty rigorous benchmarking suite that I was able to use to confirm that I actually made the performance level low, um, in increase performance slightly. Um, so that's really important also, like, sure you can do this refactoring, but like, make sure you always benchmark before and after. So in the end, I'm able to say with confidence that I reduced entropy in Mongoid, and I'm particularly happy that it'll allow other engineers to easily join the Ruby project and um, potentially open pull requests and make the code base less opaque. This work has also shifted my perspective, and I think differently about my projects. So again, my manager um, likes to ask me trick questions, and um, or in part wisdom on me, and about a month and a half ago, again, in our one-on-one -on -one meeting, he was like, um, he, so I, I come into our meetings like with the things that I've been working on to tell, give him an update, because he works in the Java driver, so he doesn't really know, he doesn't really track like every um, commit that I do and every uh, Jira ticket update that I do. So he comes into our meeting, he's like, so Emily, what did you do today to make Mongoid better? And I was like, I looked at my list and I was like, do any of these make Mongoid better? So now I always think about that. Like I go into my office in the morning and I ask myself like, what am I gonna do today, even if it's just a little thing, to make Mongoid better? And then when I leave, I'm like, did I do anything to make Mongoid better? So um, I encourage you to ask yourselves when you go to work on Monday, before you start coding, what am I gonna do today to make my code base better? So, on that note, um, I'm going to remind you, for people, uh, well, people who came in late, you might have disqualified yourselves, or at least made it so you can't email me, but email me with Sandy Metz quotes to get mustard. Um, and the other thing is, if I could hijack part of my question session and um, ask you a question, um, can everybody take out their phones? Take out your phone <laughs> and put it in the air and turn it on and sing along. One love, no, I'm just kidding. Um, can you? <laughs> Can you open your email client on your phone and um, write Emily at MongoDB as the receiver? So you don't actually have to do this if you don't want to, but... Um, so write, I'm doing this to also, so that I know how long it takes to... Okay, so write me as the receiver, and then um, write to me one sentence that like one sentence that sums up, if you've used MongoDB and you no longer use MongoDB, why? If you use MongoDB and you still use MongoDB, why? And if you've never used MongoDB and you don't want to use MongoDB, why? 
just one sentence, and that would help me so much because, um, so on this note of making Mongoloid better, I um, have been tasked, now that it's kind of, it's easier to fix bugs and it's a healthier project and other people can work on it with me, um, it's not so much of a black box anymore. I, um, I know that in the Ruby community, MongoDB is not super popular. It's not the default database. And I attribute it largely to the mindset that we're all in when we write web apps um, that is created for us, or at least imparted on us or taught to us by using Rails. Um, we all think relationally for the most part. And MongoDB challenges that and makes it kind of confusing because it's kind of relational in some ways and kind of not. And so I know that it's, there's a learning curve, and uh, Mongoid has always followed for the last 10 years this philosophy of um, following exactly what Active Record does to reduce the friction and the, the learning curve if you're going from a relational database to Mong MongoDB. Um, but I'm, now I'm pretty torn because I think that I can tell from all of the issues that are logged and the way people ask me questions that having that be the philosophy of Mongoid makes it so that people don't really learn MongoDB and how to use it properly. And so they end up building relational schemas with MongoDB, which is not always the best solution. And you end up doing many more requests to the database because we don't have joins than you want to do and that you wouldn't do if you had a Postgres backend for or database, for example. So that's, that's one philosophy. That's what it's always been doing. And I know that the switch to MongoDB is not that bad in, if we follow this path. But now there's this other path where I think that maybe I can either build a new ODM for Rails um, or for Ruby or um, adapt Mongoid to make it more modular so that you, you're not, impose, you're not uh, being put into this relational mindset automatically. So I don't know if I should make it like totally its own thing um, and uh, have and, and recognize that the learning curve would then be higher because like it's a trade-off like I might have fewer users in that way because the path to entry is much harder so I, I can't determine that just from because by definition the only people I hear about are people using Mongoid so I don't really know why other people who aren't looking at MongoDB as a perfectly acceptable option of database for Rails, why they're not using it. I can't determine that without you all telling me why. So please email me. And I have a thick skin. Like, I can handle it. You can tell, be as brutal as you want. Um, I wouldn't be working for MongoDB or standing on the stage if I took everything personally. Um, for Working for MongoDB for five years. So remember what everybody thought of MongoDB five years ago. Um, so please t be honest with me, it'll help me a lot and will help me make Mongoid better. So that's my question for you. I don't know if we have time. I wasn't really paying attention to, do uh, we have time for questions? Yeah, so we're running a bit late, but oh, I'm we, sorry. We, we, we can still take some questions if anyone has them, although... I'm happy to take questions later. I don't need okay. to take them. Um, if I know how human minds work, uh, you guys are doing the single thread thing where you are replying to the emails right now, so I don't know if you can think of any questions. Uh, but you have our email address, so the questions can go via the email, and yeah. you can uh, take the question offline, I think. Yeah. Okay, so thank, thank you very you. much. And, and